welcome back to the second of three videos sponsored by Hanyang University Erika's eOwl program on academic writing. And this video is going to be on judging and incorporating external sources in your papers. And as a recap, my name is Dr. Ken Eckert. I'm Associate Professor of English Literature here in the English Language and Culture Department at Hanyang Erika in Ansan. It's not terribly ethical for me to plug my own book in these videos, and you don't have to buy the book anyway because I'm presenting the material to you right now, but should you want more information, this is where it's from. And now you know where I'm drawing the material from. The previous episode in this video series covered an introduction to academic writing and some terminology, and we discussed planning, thesis statements, and structure. Again, in this video, we're going to move on to more abstract or advanced issues, primarily, again, the selection and incorporation of secondary sources. The first chapter we're going to begin with, or section, is on rhetorical proof. And you can see here, these three fine gentlemen will be discussing the issues of logos, pathos, and ethos. Rhetoric, briefly defined, is the art and technique of persuasion. And Aristotle didn't invent these concepts, but he's the first major author or critic who we have surviving texts for. And it's difficult to underestimate the importance of Aristotle to Western civilization. He was a student of Plato himself and went on to be a teacher of Alexander the Great. And Aristotle, in modern terms, would be considered a polymath, he was interested in everything. He wrote on science, engineering, physics, literary theory, philosophy, psychology, and rhetoric. He was highly regarded in the Muslim world, and many of our surviving texts of Aristotle only come to us through Arabic translations. He was also highly respected in Christian Europe, and even in a text like Dante's Inferno, which was written in the 1300s, and the first part of the story is set in hell, and hell is divided into multiple layers. Uh, although Aristotle was a pre-Christian pagan, they still put him in a nice, comfortable level of hell, where they have some air conditioning and a bit of Wi-Fi and American beer, presumably. So the Christian Europeans still highly regarded Aristotle, even though, again, he was pre-Christian. Now, Aristotle's arguments on rhetoric were not really for text. He intended his concepts to be applied for oral purposes in a court or an assembly, but they perfectly or mostly perfectly apply to the situation of writing. And the thing about rhetoric is that it's a bit like the word argument. It has a more negative uh, connotation in common use. Just as I said, often people have a very negative association with the word argument. Rhetoric also sometimes has the uh, nuance that it's empty words meant to fill up time and to manipulate people's emotions. But rhetoric, properly speaking, is again the art of persuasion, and not necessarily about the truth or ethics of the argument itself, but about convincing an audience of their correctness and at the right moment, uh, what the Greeks would call a kairos moment. The three branches of Aristotelian proof are logos, pathos, and ethos, and we'll look at them in that order. Logos looks very familiar. It's an easy word to recognize. It sounds like logic, and that's what it is. That's what the word is cognate with. And logos says does the argument make sense? Does it make logical sense? Is it uniform in its parts? And the Greeks often used a sort of logical device called the syllogism, made of a major and minor premise and then a conclusion. For example, Mrs. Kim claims she saw an owl at the time of the crime. The crime happened in daytime, and owls are nocturnal. Therefore, Mrs. Kim can't be correct. Here's where it gets interesting. A paper or even an individual claim could involve any or all of these forms of rhetoric. 
logic, pathos, ethos. If your claim is purely logic oriented, like much of Western logic, it's pretty binary. It either works great or it doesn't work at all. A good logos argument is very difficult to refute. A bad one may be damaging or fatal to the credibility of your paper's arguments. You can see here an example of a faulty syllogism. Only people wear glasses. Tom does not wear glasses. Therefore, Tom is not a person. Well, you can see here that's a ridiculous claim. And if something like this were in an academic paper, it would discredit the rest of the essay. You can see some other examples here of faulty logic. And I'm using simple examples to help illustrate the ideas in play, and hopefully you can recognize the errors. A false analogy tries to compare two things that are not the same. Korea and New Zealand are not, are not in the same geographical situation. A false binary uh, falsely pretends that there's only two possibilities, either or. An ad hominem argument, Latin for against the man, attacks the person making the argument instead of the argument itself. Bandwagon arguments or bandwagon logical errors, they can be more difficult to diagnose. Here, 78% uh, of people in a survey have a certain position. That may be contributory evidence, or at least uh, proof that you should consider the claim seriously, but it's not absolute evidence. Things are not right simply because the majority believes it is. It's not always so easy as this in the real world. There's going to be situations where you're doing research, where you're assessing another source, where you're creating your own arguments and your own chain of reasoning, where there's going to be gray areas where you're not sure if something makes logical sense or not. This is an actual news article by the New York Times of all people. Want to live longer? Try going to the opera. Researchers in Britain have found that people who reported going to a museum or concert even once a year lived longer. Is that true? Well, it, the statistic may be true, but is that what caused people to live longer, the opera or museum attendance? Or is it that the people who can previously afford to go to an opera or a museum are going to be in better health? So the question is, is the correlation causation? What happened first? Or another example, a common statistic, 20 to 40% of affairs end in divorce. Did the affair cause the divorce? Or is it that the marriages where an affair happened were already troublesome or problematic marriages. What happened first? It would be a mistake to assume the easiest or the most complex explanation. It would require you to look more deeply and to think more carefully about the chain of causation in these events. Beware of ignoring or misinterpreting counter evidence. We're all humans, we're all prone to this. And sometimes when you get too far in your paper writing, you start to get too personally invested in your arguments and you become resistant to evidence that counters your findings. And so it's easy to say when you read something that contradicts what you found, it must be wrong or faulty. And for, there's an example of this called the Kafka trap. And I'm using a nice neutral, neutral, uh, ethnicity, those Martians committed crime X. The Martians admit it. This is proof that they did it. The Martians deny it. This is proof that they did it because that's exactly what someone who denies a crime would say. Well, you can see here that this is a no-win situation for the Martians, and it's another example of faulty reasoning. Pathos is an evidentiary or persuasive strategy that attempts to move the heart, that uh, uh, tries to evoke sympathy for the arguments being proposed. Aristotle saw logic as the best and purest form of persuasion, but he conceded that in the real world, sometimes emotional arguments could work. And if you look at most advertisements, most media or corporate ad advertisements, 
they tend to appeal to basic emotional feelings or impulses in us. They often appeal to feelings of sex, status, or security. If you are in the STEM fields, if you're in a scientific field right now, you might be rolling your eyes. When would I ever use an emotional argument in discussing the chemical efficacy of a process? And you're right. Typically in an academic paper, the uses of pathos strategies are going to be very limited. To me, it's like the icing on a cake that judiciously applied here and there, it may be highly effective, but it's not something that you want to base your paper on because the reader is going to feel emotionally manipulated or may, may feel that your argumentation is simply childish. I can think of a few good examples where you might use pathos, say in a social sciences paper where you're discussing a social issue you may discuss uh, how that social issue applied to you in real life. When I, was, when I was teaching in Las Vegas, a student wrote a paper on alcoholism, and she wrote about how her college roommate in dormitory was affected by alcoholism. That, I think, is an effective use. But of course, uh, with the proviso that you could easily go overboard with it. Ethos. Well, don't be fooled. Ethos doesn't mean ethics. That's what it sounds like, but that's not what it means. And an unethical person could still have ethos. Ethos refers to the authority or reputation of the writer or speaker. In short, how much trust does the reader have in you? And one of the unfortunate parts of life is that Ethos is really more about the perception of the speaker's credibility, and it can be falsely judged. And Aristotle, I think, was basically a good guy. His assumption was that the argument you're trying to persuade your audience of is a good one and a true one. But that's one of the reasons rhetoric has a bad reputation in common parlance, because sometimes people use rhetoric to convince people of terrible things. There's another English expression that gold in the pockets of fools is still gold. And the meaning of the expression is that even if a stupid person says the truth, it's still the truth. Again, unfortunately, in the real world, that's not true. We judge people based on their appearance. And you can see it right now. I'm wearing a shirt and tie. If I was wearing a dirty t-shirt, you might not trust what I'm saying even though it would be the same words. And that's just the nature of life. You can see down here in the image. Uh, if you ever watch CNN at the station break, a voice says, this is CNN. And that's the voice of James Earl Jones, who played uh, Darth Vader in the Star Trek, Star Wars movies. The character on the right is uh, a clerk who often appears on The Simpsons. And the joke with that clerk is that he has this falsetto ad adolescent voice. If he voiced that station break and said, this is CNN, uh, people might not trust what CNN has to say. And that brings us to ethos in writing, in writing your papers. And I'm because ethos is so crucial and so critical, I'm going to talk about it in two aspects. The first is visual ethos. I'll be getting to APA, MLA, IEEE citation standards in a moment. Part of the reason they exist is that they place the paper in the context of a professional community. The paper looks better. And you might be saying, well, that's not fair. You should be judging the paper based on its contents and arguments, not on its visual presentation. You're right, but that's not how the real world works. And even I'm guilty of this. If I receive a paper from a student that has clean fonts, correct page formatting, everything looks nice and precise, it seems superior to me than one that has bad ink or crinkles. And even with an electronic text, this, this makes a difference. I often tell my undergraduates that the cheapest investment they can make in their education is to buy a box of paper clips. 
because if I get a paper from a student that doesn't have a paper clip and the edges are crinkled together and the student says, sorry, professor, I forgot my paper clip, it already looks cheap and amateurish to me. Sorry, life's not fair. Textual ethos. Well, now we're on more solid ground, I think, that a more professional and academic vocabulary makes your paper look better. It makes you look smarter. It makes you look more knowledgeable. Yes, I know we're talking about the appearance of competence as opposed to actual competence, but for now, let's stop being cynical and let's assume that you do know what you're talking about, but how do you convince your reader that you know what you're talking about through textual ethos. And again, part of that is your word choice and your the academic tone of your writing. We'll talk about that later when we get to editing. For now, we're going to concentrate on secondary sources. And what do they do? They place you within a community of experts and they make you seem more important. I've talked about logos, pathos, and ethos. Now, a pay, an argument or a piece of secondary evidence in your paper could be all or any of those approaches at the same time. And again, because textual ethos, I think, is so critical to an academic paper, it's going to be the subject of a whole chapter or two. So let's talk about how to choose your sources and how to decide what is useful or credible or persuasive while planning and researching your paper. And maybe to belabor the point, to stress the importance of using external sources, that by doing so, the writer enters a conversation with other experts and makes the paper seem more interesting and credible. And you can see an example here at the bottom of the page. Many people are addicted to the internet nowadays. Gee, thanks, I know that. That's really not very persuasive. A 2019 Pew study claimed that 64% of US female blah, 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 a specific quote with uh, precise information is going to be more credible. And often when I see undergraduate papers that are too short, they don't have enough external evidence and it feels like there's something missing to the content of the essay. And what sometimes uh, poor writers do is to fill up the space of a paper, they just add more claims. And what happens when you do that is that the paper is just a list, whereas the paper would likely be more persuasive with more external sources. A bit of terminology before we continue. You may have heard these terms before. A primary source is the subject of your paper, so what you are writing on. If your paper is about a novel, that's the primary source. If you're writing about a study or a set of experiments, that is your primary source of information. Secondary sources are writings about those things. So a paper about a novel, uh, articles or books about that novel are secondary sources. Or again, if you were working on an experiment or some idea, uh, books that talk about those surveys or experiments are secondary. A tertiary source would be something like an encyclopedia, which lists or catalogs both primary and secondary sources. All of these sources would be listed at the end of your paper, and, and the term for that list varies. It could be called a reference list or a work cited list. We'll get to that soon. One of the hardest skills to master is judging sources. And it's a different world from when I was in high school and when I was an undergraduate in the 80s. Back then, it was difficult to find enough sources. I had to go to the library, search through these giant catalogs of periodicals, find them on the stacks. Now we're drowning in information on the internet and the skill set you need to develop is the opposite, winnowing out the useful and credible material from among all the junk. And I think with print sources, it's easier to make these judgments because you can rely on certain visual clues. If you feel the piece of writing, the book, the periodical, the magazine in your hands, you can see uh, what are the fonts, what are the images, 
what does the piece of text look like? And you can see examples here of an academic periodical with small text and professional looking logos and then a popular magazine in the middle and a tabloid newspaper on the right. So that's not so hard to judge. Whether you're using print or online materials, there is also a sort of informal food chain of academic sources. At the top, the gold standard is academic journal articles in the SCI, SSCI, and ANHCI, Thomson Reuters journal indexes, as well as monographs from prestige presses. If you have articles or books that are in this category, pretty much you can't go wrong. They're going to be written by scholars, they're going to be peer-reviewed by the leading authorities in the field. Moving down from there, we get pretty good. We get academic journal articles in Scopus, uh, the Korean National Research Foundation, Skimago or Shimago indexes, monographs from lesser presses. They're not bad, they may be good, they may be perfectly credible, but they may not uh, they may not evoke the same sort of credibility or ethos in the reader, but they may, they may also be written by scholars and peer-reviewed. Moving down, good materials, articles in major newspapers and magazines, self-published books, articles from non-index journals, videos and documentaries, they may be okay, but uh, chances are they're written by career journalists or experts who may not be scholars. They may or may not be peer-reviewed, and by peer-reviewed I mean uh, evaluated and critiqued by other scholars in the field. Below there, fair to poor articles and tabloid papers and media sites, personal blog sites, social media. Sometimes that material might be useful, probably it's not going to be very credible, because anybody can write these things with little or no oversight. How will I know? There's no way to know. You have to do your best and you have to learn from experience and sometimes you have to trust your instincts. And if you can't recognize the source and if you don't have a book or a physical article to hold in your hand, you have to trust your judgment. Text with slang and vulgarity is probably going to be less credible and persuasive. Text that itself refers to secondary sources and has statistical evidence and greater sentence complexity, that's probably going to be more reliable for you. Another way of protecting yourself is to have a variety. If you have a paper that has a hundred sources in it, if two or three of them are sketchy or dubious ones, uh, that's not the end of the world. But if your paper has five sources and two of them are, are dubious ones, that's really going to uh, cause the reader to question, question your paper's authority. So lots is good. And try to incorporate a variety of textual sources, such as articles, books, interviews, YouTube videos, newspapers. Uh, genre variety is good as well uh, a wider geographical and chronological sweep where possible. If your paper is about Wi-Fi, you can't use so many sources from 50 years ago, but where it's relevant or possible, you might try to have sources from other time periods and certainly other countries or cultures to give you a wider perspective on your, on your information. Another way of protecting yourself is to use some physical sources. Try not to get everything online. There's still a part of my old school brain that when I read a paper and all of the sources are electronic ones, uh, I think lazy undergraduate in pajamas who can't be bothered to go to a library. Much of the most respectable academic work is still in print. And that's the nature of the beast. Printed sources are expensive to produce, and so the quality of review is often higher because a press doesn't want to lose money or reputation by having bad articles or bad text. Real print books and journals simply suggest more gravitas, again, especially to older readers, the generation older than me, in particular, the baby boomers.
that may change. How about different or opposing views? Absolutely. A reader is going to have more trust in your paper if you concede arguments and experts who disagree with you. And readers may be suspicious if you conspicuously or obviously avoid a major authority who has an opposing viewpoint to yours. Well, I said in episode one of this video, you need to have a consistent argument, but yes, you still need to concede that other authorities don't agree with you. How would you handle those ideas or viewpoints? Well, you could argue that Dr. X's opinion is a minority or an unpopular one. You could argue that Dr. X's opinion is not applicable to the situation you're discussing. Or if you're really good as a power move, you might civilly argue why you feel Dr. X is wrong. As a short digression here, do be careful about joke websites. Occasionally, I've had papers where students got burned by this, where they quoted from a joke or a satire website. It's an easy mistake to make if you are not from Western culture or if you're a non-native English speaker. There are popular satire websites or newspapers, such as The Onion and The Babylon Bee, which have joke parody websites. And how do you know? How can you tell? If you look at the article, a few common red flags or giveaways are that the articles have swear words or ridiculous or extreme situations. If you're not sure, you might do a search of that outlet. You could Google the Babylon Bee and then the entry might explain that this is a joke website. Scholarly search engines are your friend. There's nothing wrong with regular search sites such as Google or Naver or whatever, but they're not made for academia. They're made for a popular audience, and some of the hits are going to be paid ads. It is uh, highly useful to learn how to use these scholarly engines such as uh, Google's books or scholar sites or your own university library website. Because another unfortunate fact, much research is paywalled, and my, uh, a great deal of these journal articles, they are on a subscription basis. They're not free, and so they're not available on search sites such as Google. You may need to access them uh, only through your university library website. Your university tuition, or if you're a professor, part of your pay, is going to these university libraries to help pay for subscriptions to these article databases. You may as well use them if you're paying for them. Uh, another nice bonus, uh, at least for Hanyang students, is that if you are on campus, often if you're using Google Scholar, it will recognize the location you're at and it will allow you to access these articles through your li the library website. You can see here an image from the Hanyang Library website, the search engine that's used to find articles and monographs. Uh, again, they're often disseminated on company or foundation databases on a subscription basis that's paid for by your campus library. Some of them can be very expensive. When you're looking for articles, they may be indexed on several databases. Some of these databases, such as JSTOR, ACM, whatever, they can be discipline specific. So it, you may want to access multiple databases. Usually they will allow downloading of PDFs so that you can read the articles at, at your own time. Using search terms. Now we're talking about ninja level power moves and using plus minus and quote marks may help greatly minimize false hits while you're doing internet searches. As an example, metal fatigue. It sounds like a rock band, but it's not. But if you were writing an engineering paper on this subject, if you type in these two words into an, even an academic search engine, you might get everything that has metal or fatigue in it. And so you're going to get thousands or millions of irrelevant hits. Typing metal fatigue in quotes forces the search engine to look only for that exact string sequence.
Another example, Merchant of Venice. I tried this myself. This gives you 164 million hits because Google looks for any page that has Merchant or Venice in it. But Merchant of Venice gives only 12 million. Plus, if you type in Jane Austen, you're going to get everything. There was a novel written in 1989, this sort of semi-comedy novel that combined Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice with zombies. Jane Austen plus zombies is another way of narrowing down your search hits. Minus does the opposite. If you were writing, I don't know why you would do this, but say you were writing a paper about the actress Anne Hathaway. If you type that into a search engine, you're going to get lots of hits about Anne Hathaway, who was Shakespeare's wife, who had the same name. But if you type in Anne Hathaway minus Shakespeare, it will eliminate all the incidences of pages that talk about Shakespeare. Another way of protecting yourself when you're looking for external sources is to be careful about avoiding bias. And you might want to be wary or slightly more skeptical about using sources from corporate, political, or religious organizations. Some may be very reputable. That doesn't mean I'm ruling out all of these categories. The University of Notre Dame is a religious university, but it has first-rate academic output. But some of these sources, they may only be promoting an agenda or selling a product, such as a corporate or a fan site. Well, I don't want to offend the Koreans who may be watching this video. And this applies to people from any country. Anyone could be tempted to do this. But be careful of government or promotional text, which only gives a positive slant on something. And as an example, here's a newspaper article about Songdo, a subdivision in Incheon, and it only says nice things about Songdo. If you were to quote this in an academic paper, uh, the reader's trust in your arguments are going to be quickly undermined. Can I use the Bible as a source? Ooh, that's a touchy question. I say yes, I'm a Christian, I see nothing wrong with using scripture in an academic paper where it is relevant to the subject. I think the danger is in overusing that source because you could allow your personal faith or non-faith feelings to unduly influence your judgment. And look at this from the perspective of your reader. If the reader was reading a paper on bridge construction, and you continually quote biblical scripture or lines from the Quran or Upanishads or whatever holy document, the reader is going to uh, lose faith in your arguments because, again, this may not be relevant at all to the subject. Can I use Wikipedia as a source? Yes, I say you can. I think Wikipedia is wonderful. I write for it. I consult it sometimes. I do occasionally quote it in an academic paper, but only occasionally, because I realize that some readers do not respect Wikipedia, and again, whatever credibility I have may be quickly undermined by its overuse. I think Wikipedia is more useful as a tertiary source. It's an excellent place to find other secondary sources. As a coda, a last a uh, pet peeve of mine is that sometimes experts assume they are experts in every subject. That's something you might also uh, be wary of. As an example, Sigmund Freud at the end of his life seemed to believe he was an expert on everything, and he wrote books on things that he had no competence in. As much as I like Bill Gates, as important as a humanitarian and philanthropist as he is, Sometimes Bill Gates writes about things he doesn't, where he doesn't know what he's talking about. If he writes an article on computer software, it's going to be highly authoritative. When he talks about third world debt, maybe not so much. At this point, the good news is that we are halfway through this video episode and this video series. There is an end in sight to your torture. The bad news is that the next section is on citation systems, which is 
pretty dry, and I wish I could make this fun and exciting and sexy, but I can't. It has to be learned. And I'm sure doubly thrilling for you is the history of citation, but I'm hoping a brief overview will be relevant or will help contextualize the ideas I'm going to discuss. In the ancient and medieval world, there really wasn't a, an organized system of citation or footnoting, a source just informally mentioned where information comes from. By the early modern era, books have notes and margins, but it's scholars such as Edward Gibbons who helps popularize basic footnoting and citation standards with his decline and fall of the Roman Empire. But it wasn't until the 20th century that standardized citation systems began to emerge. The first is Chicago format from 1906, but others followed, such as APA, which is popular in the social sciences, MLA, which, is, which dominates in the humanities and English literature, and more recently, the IEEE standard, which is in fact based on Chicago, which is dominant in STEM and engineering fields. They're all arbitrary systems. None of them are based on tablets handed down from the heavens, and they all have their own strengths and weaknesses. For example, APA uh, ha features the year of the publication in the citation because it's a field where research changes quickly. Other standards don't. I'm going to talk about three aspects of citation, no surprise. The first one is going to be title pages. And you can see from the template here, an APA title page is fairly self-explanatory. Attach the sheets with a paper clip, as I indicated, because professors like to lay out the sheets side by side and read them, and they can't do that easily if the pages are stapled. A couple things I do want to say. One is, please don't use a giant font to make your title page look like a Broadway musical advertisement. Use the same font and size as the rest of your paper. You can use boldface if you like. As well, in, in APA, we have running heads, and that's a short form of your title on the top of the sheet. This helps automated scanning systems and other indexing systems to categorize your paper. MLA is quite similar, with the exception that there actually is no title page in MLA. You begin with the essential information and you begin the text on the same page. As well in MLA, you don't have a running head. You would put your last name or the names of the authors on the top right. The second subtopic I'm going to discuss is end text references, which come at the end of the paper. In APA, this is called a reference list. And you can see here these entries, they have their own standard syntax based on genre, whether it's a book or a journal article or a movie or a tweet or an email or whatever. There are automated systems that help you do some of the heavy lifting here. But uh, two things I want to emphasize at this point. One is that you learn indentation. You can see how Microsoft Word handles this. You should also learn how to alphabetize. And letting the word processor handle these two tasks for you is going to automate a great deal of work. Here is the MLA version of mText references. And this is called a works cited list. And you can see the indentation and the alphabetization is the same, even though the syntax is different. One of the reasons I like MLA is that it's a little bit more economical and a bit more efficient than APA. But again, different fields have their own priorities. One thing I want to stress, whatever system you're using, is that if you use an automated citation system or a website that generates these entries for you, that's fine, it's no crime, but do make sure that you proofread the result because the website or system may not, may not give you uniform fonts or colors. Moving on to in-text citation, you can see a very simple example here and a bit of terminology that you should know 
the information that introduces or bisects or ends the quotation. That is called a signal phrase. What you actually quote in quotation marks is obviously the quotation. The citation refers to the information in parentheses that helps you identify or locate that source in your reference or citation list at the end. Now, the basic citation is like this, last name, comma, the year it was published, and the page number. There is a kind of decision tree if you are missing some of that information. Ideally, you know the last name and the year number and so on. If you don't, at least cite the title. And if you don't even have that, I'm not sure why you're using the source to begin with, if it lacks even an organizational name. But if you need to use it, you might again use a short form of the title in quotation marks. If you don't know the date in APA, you indicate ND, no date. If you have a very long list of authors that goes beyond four or five or six or so, list the first and then have et al, which is Latin for et ali and the others. In MLA, Basically the same logic, signal phrase, quotation, citation, except MLA has a simpler citation syntax, last name, space, page number. And you can see the decision tree is similar. Something I do want to append here is that whatever system you're using, if there's no page number because it's an electronic source, that's fine, you just skip that. And if you want to get fancy, you could add the chapter number or paragraph number, but not everyone does this. The very worst thing to do is two things. One is to have a vague citation, Google. Google is not a citation. That's just the website you found it on. Even worse than that is dumping in the entire HTML of the website into the page text. And that simply looks like your filling space. It looks very amateurish. Please don't do this. There is now a cornucopia of different citation systems. And there's even systems that are used in only some countries. And even Harvard, being Harvard, has to have their own citation standard. I do want to talk about IEEE because those of you who are engineering students may be using that system. I'm not as familiar with IEEE, but I like it. It's a very nice, efficient system, appropriate for engineers. And IEEE is based on Chicago, and like Chicago, it simply uses a number to indicate the link to the, to the source. And at the bottom of the page, or at the end of the paper, the sources are indicated, but not in alphabetical order. They're indicated in the order that they appear in the text as you can see in the example here. And another advantage I think IEEE has over Chicago is economy. Chicago has footnotes and endnotes, and then it has a reference list as well. IEEE just has the one reference at the end. More on footnotes. They're used all the time in Chicago system. That's the basis of the citation system. And you can see an example here where there's a quotation, and then at the end, there's a superscript number, which links you to the full footnote at the bottom of the page, thus a footnote. Or the footnotes could go at the end of the paper before the reference list. You can use footnotes in other systems. Uh, often you may want to take a piece of information away from the main dialogue that distracts such as a note saying, for more information, go here. I find you can quickly overdo footnotes. They can clutter the text or they can look pretentious. But judiciously used, I think they're effective. A little more on citing literature, because those of you who are writing such papers should maybe know about this peculiar convention, that such papers often cite the name of the work in short form, not the author. So you can see here Gatsby Catcher referring to the short forms of novel names in italics because they're novels or plays. Short stories and poems are in quotation marks. 
thus Harlem Paul's case again with the page number. And if there's no page number, there's no page number, such as a online text where you might be a nice person and provide the chapter number, or for a poem, there is usually the convention that you use a slash to indicate line division and you list the line numbers. Figures and tables, they could go in text or they could go at the end of your paper. I think this is fairly self-explanatory. You can see here, there's slightly different conventions for APA and MLA for figures, tables, and other inserted graphical information. Quotation refers to the selection and integration of textual phrases or sentences or information into your text, what you are citing. And if you remember, I had a chapter only on thesis statements and the same with quoting, which should tell you something about the importance I'm attaching to it. I understand most of you are not going to be composition theorists, and what I'm teaching in these videos is a means to an end, and I know that your priority is the content of your papers. But I think you should take this seriously. This is more difficult than it looks, and I think one attribute in academic writing which really does separate the professor from the student is effective quotation. Seven different ways to quote. Why so many? You were probably expecting three, but I can think of a good seven different variations or frames that you can use for arranging a quotation in a paper. The first is author-focused. That may be the most familiar or recognizable one to you, according to someone quotation citation. Nutritionist Sheila Ford notes that quotation citation. Easy to apply. Why not just write your entire paper that way? Because it's boring. Uh, it gets pretty repetitive to have the same format for your quotations, and also different ways of arranging the quote can be more efficient. And that becomes more important when we get into editing later on. The second variation is quote focused. The chief problem is that quote, and then at the end, the name of the person or the source. You might do this when it's not really important who said this. If you're quoting Einstein, sure, but if you're quoting some scholar somewhere, it may be a more economical use of space to use this form. Number three, split quote. The 1980 campaign featured a president with, quote, under whose policies, quote. Why do this? Well, again, variety but it also might be a nice way of splitting up a very long quote with a, a section in the middle that's less useful for you. So you might be able to use the beginning and the end of a long sentence. Number four, I'm reluctant to tell you it's my favorite because then you'll think it's the best form, but it's just me. I like keyword quotes where you just quote one or two words. And again, it's a nice economical way of phrasing. You can see the example here where it's just a few words. If you do a keyword quote, or in fact, if you do any of these forms, be careful that you ethically represent the source as faithfully as you can. So imagine here where you read in a book, no one can say that I like eating mushrooms. I will always hate them. If you quoted that person, quote, I like eating mushrooms, you've technically accurately quoted them, but that's obviously the opposite of what the person meant. Number five is a block quote. Someone makes an important point, skip a line, indent, and then you have a long chunk of text. Notice there's no quotation marks because you've already visually indicated what you're doing. Here we get into another ethical matter. Use block quotes sparingly. Don't be tempted to fill in space with them. And about once a year, I get a paper where some lazy student has said, this is a very important problem, and then has a two paragraph quote in order to fill half the paper. I average about one block quote a paper myself. Any more than that, you're starting to push your luck and undermine the trust that the reader has in your paper. Number six is a paraphrase quote, where 
you are rephrasing the information in your own words. And you can see here, you don't need quotation marks when you do that because it's your words. You still have to cite it because it's someone else's information though. A paraphrase might be shorter or longer than the original. And you can see the example here where the, a brief line from Hamlet is quoted, but then there's a longer explanation of what it means. The seventh and last way to quote is an indirect quote, where someone may speak or write something and then that information is reprinted in another text and you need to indicate to your reader where this comes from. So for example, Pope Francis uh, makes a speech, Newsweek prints that speech, you have to indicate Newsweek did not write that, the Pope did. So you would have here quoted in Newsweek or in APA as cited in. Although ideally, if you can, you should try to find the original source, if possible. With a speech, you can't, but if a, a text is quoting another text, you should at least try to find the original. Translations, I think because I'm addressing Korean or many second language learners, this may also be an ethical issue that, again, you should try to do your level best to represent the translation as best you can. And in fact, sometimes when a, a translation is inserted into a text, you'll have own translation after the citation to indicate that's your attempt to translate. Or what you might also do is indicate both of the sources. So Dr. Park advised his son that clothes make the man, ochi nageda, and then you have both. And sometimes there may be a nuance in the original text that you want to communicate. In your end text list, uh, it's good practice to indicate both of both forms. Another ethical issue, which I think is relevant for those of you writing on literary fiction, is that you should be careful to distinguish between the author and the characters in your quotations. Rowling says, come with me and see the Great Hall. Rowling didn't say that. Hagrid said that. And I know sometimes this may feel obvious, but look at the next example. I do see this on Facebook sometimes. A man can be happy with any woman as long as he does not love her. Oscar Wilde did not say that. One of his characters in his books said that in The Picture of Dorian Gray, and it's not accurate to attribute these ideas or sentiments to the author. He may not mean those ideas or agree with his own characters. So I think it's good practice to design your signal phrases so that they indicate a character is speaking or a narrator is speaking and not the author, such as Hagrid says, or Henry says, or the narrator says, which tells you that's not necessarily the author's views. I warned you that quotation is harder than it looks because you need to think about the ethics, you need to think about the content, and you need to think about the grammar. And this, I think, is a problem in that's particularly so in English, which is so particular with its verb tenses and numberings and pronoun usages. Be careful that your quoted works form a grammatical sentence when combined with your signal phrase. So you can see the example here where the will clashes with the were. And if you're not sure, one thing you could try is remove the quotation marks and then see if it reads like a natural sentence. And then that might help you fix it. A few years ago, a graduate student asked me a question. I think he was an engineering student from Bangladesh. He said, if I'm quoting from a study, what, what verb tense should I have in my signal phrase? I said, well, there's really no rule. There's different conventions and different disciplines, but I can only make some common sense suggestions. In literature, we often use present tense because technically, the characters don't exist. They're existing as you read them. If you were quoting a scholar, you might use present or continuous tense, and that would convey a sort of immediacy or continuing relevance in the source. So Bloom observes or Weber and Stock have found. I think past tense is often effective when you want to uh, differentiate the source, where you want to chronologically place it in the past because perhaps the research is no longer relevant or it's been superseded.
But again, I don't think you really have to overthink this distinction. One thing I really want to stress is to avoid orphan quotes. And what I mean by that is a quote that stands by itself with no signal phrase at all. And you can see the example here. This is only quotation marks and a citation. This feels awkward and abrupt. It would be much better, I think, to contextualize the quotes with a signal phrase, even if it's just with a colon. Another way of avoiding orphan quotes, or a good way of developing quotation practice generally, is to write quotation sandwiches. I've already used a hamburger. Now we're going to try a sandwich analogy. What that means is that you lead into the discussion you lead up to the quote, give the quote, and then have some sort of interaction or response to the quote before moving on. You can see the example here where this combination of sentences has a sort of dialogue or interplay with the quotation, which I think is much more effective than drive-by quoting, where you shovel in a quote and then roar away with the tires screeching. Another idea for you to chew on, in addition to the sandwich, is what Eric Hayat advises, which is to design your paragraphs in a sort of upward hook shape. And so what he recommends you do is that you begin your paragraph with introduction material, and you have the most difficult or abstract part of the paragraph about two-thirds, three-quarters in, and then you move down and conclude with easier material before beginning your next paragraph. And it's not a bad idea to try this, and I think having that regular variation between easier and more difficult material helps your reader digest it all. Plagiarism is maybe not the happiest way of ending this chapter, but I think it needs to be covered. It is a very serious academic crime in the West, and increasingly so in the rest of the world. And in fact, it damaged Joe Biden's presidential candidate run in 1987, when someone uncovered some of his college papers that were plagiarized. And if he had not done so, he may have been American president 30 years earlier. Plagiarism is not a concrete theft, such as stealing a PowerPoint clicker or a smartphone. It's the theft of credit for someone else's work. And that's an important distinction because text can be used by someone else freely. You don't have to pay for it so long as you cite it. There are fair use provisions in most of the world with this allowance that if you're using text for academic or non-profit uses, you can, as long as you say so. One problem with plagiarism is accurately defining it, and different organizations have tried to disseminate a technical definition of plagiarism, none I think very persuasively. I like Justice Potter's famous quote about pornography that I don't know what it is, but I know it when I see it. And that's generally the case with plagiarism, particularly the cut and dried type of plagiarism where you copy and paste the original text without attribution. A professor can usually recognize this without much difficulty. But there are gray areas, rephrasing the original text's specific information without attribution, that's probably plagiarism. Incorporating a source's broad information, now you're really getting into gray areas. Usually professors are human beings and they may make a judgment call on this, but certainly the higher you go in academia, the less forgiving other people are going to be. You can get away with plagiarism maybe as a high school student. As a doctoral candidate, pack your bags if you're caught. A common question is, what about something I read in a book, which is common knowledge? Everyone knows this. In that case, it's a judgment call, but you may not need to cite it. You can see the examples here of famous paintings, and these are pastiches or parodies made with Photoshop. But you don't, you probably don't need to explicitly say the names of these paintings, because people would recognize them and know you didn't make them. And again, I think most professors and scholars, they're human beings on this, and they'll try to decide whether the plagiarism was intentional or accidental. Summing up, we're at the end of our second video now.
and I'm hoping you're getting more used to my sense of humor by now, that sometimes I make this process seem like torment, but I'm hoping at least sometimes that writing is enjoyable for you and that these videos are productive for you. This is the end of this video, and in the next one we're going to be looking at advanced writing, such as uh, more nuts and bolts details of theses and dissertations, committees, monographs, and conference papers. And for now, take care.